the jacket. <laughs> oh no. So actually I was thinking I really want uh, a vintage or not so vintage, but anyway, a typewriter. Uh, for for writing poetry because actually I realized that I like handwriting, but when creating poems I feel more comfortable with a keyboard. But I want I don't want a laptop. I want a machine and I want but I want paper, but I want a machine at the same time. Yeah, I get yeah. you. I, I just want to, don't have the money for that, but I'm thinking about it from time to time. You know time. what the nice thing what is about the typewriter? Live. You can do an stream of consciousness. Blue, blue. Yeah, yeah. And Ada, we are now live, so. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. But but I think our conversation is okay for presentation. It's, <laughs> it's, it's Rosie's turn now to That's pick nice. it up, girl. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to chat to each other. You can use the chat form. Yeah, yeah. Um, otherwise, it might be good if people muted themselves for the time yeah, being. Uh, so unless you're reading, um, to keep things on the low key. All right, thanks, guys. So yeah, here we are with the six hundred and fifty-one Ovale, um, and we're six hundred fifty-first. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and here we are, and. I'm a little nervous, obviously. I'm not used to these online forums, so you'll have to bear with me while I find my bearings. Okay, so how will the evening pan out? We will start with the five word challenge. And after that, we'll have a few announcements and I will introduce our guest poets for the night, who are Yuyitsu Sharma and Kubis Moolman. So we're in for a real treat there, both um, amazingly accomplished poets so we're going to be listening to some wonderful poetry and of course the wonderful poetry will continue with the open mic so without further ado we will get the five word challenge going and for the five word challenge we would like all of you present here and I guess people who are listening on Facebook can also contribute so if you're on Facebook and you have a word that you'd like to hear in a poem you can um, send it to us and otherwise the people that are taking part here tonight you can send us a word and the first five words to appear in the chat will be used to create poems whereby you guys will all get 15 minutes to compose a piece of poetry that needs to contain all five words after the 15 minutes those of you that are brave enough um, shall be invited to read your poem and afterwards, everybody has to vote on their favorite poet by writing winner and the name of the poet after them in the chat box. And that's how we will discover the winner, which is a really good way actually, because usually we have a clapometer which relies on the MC's ears, which is always a daunting task for the MC because you have to try and listen to the claps and decide who got the loudest clap. And people don't always clap very loudly for the lovely sensitive poems because they're all a bit like, hmm, that was lovely and gentle and we don't want to clap so loudly all over that. So it's not always the fairest um, method of judging the poetry. So do we have five words? We do. The five words are premonition, choir, honey, ghost, and B flash which is a note and a word, I guess. I'll make it one. So I'll say them one more time. Premonition, choir, honey, ghost, and B flash. So guys, you have 15 minutes to compose your poetry. May the poetry gods be with you.
Okie dokie, folks. That's your 15 minute call. Um, so I hope you managed to scribble something down. And if you didn't, sure, what does it matter? Um, you can finish it later. Um, so if you would like to read your five word poem, just put your name in the chat box with five words and your name. And while those are gathering, I'm going to say hello to a few people on Facebook. I believe we have Joanna Ducapati watching. Hello, Joanna. And who else is there? James Walsh, John W. Sexton. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, who else has joined us here now? Michelle Delay. Hi, how are you? Susanna, Melissa. So we have quite a few continents represented tonight, which is, which is kind of amazing really that uh, people from all over the world are here right now writing poems. We've got a few names coming up there. Okay, so I guess we can get the five word competition started. And your prize tonight, lads, is volume eight of the five word anthology. And this lovely book called Magdalena, Poems by Marie Howe. Marie Howe, yeah. Okay. So first up, oh yeah, and just remember to listen very carefully and try and remember the, the poet or the poem that you most liked um, so that you can give them your thumbs up at the end. Okay, so first up is all the way from Argentina, Melissa Marino. I hope I said that right. I'll just unmute you if you can't unmute. Oh, you've done it. I'm Lisa Maurinho here. Okay. Um, this is my first time doing this, so I'm a bit nervous. Um, the poem um, is called Spring in B-flat. So here it goes. It was not a dream, not a premonition. The future was an abstract presence that gave substance to the absence that remained from our common past. You released your ghost in the backyard, each ghost rooted and became a wildflower. We gave each flower a name, as we have done with bliss and failures so many times without giving it a thought. The B-flat note grew in the spring air, and a herd of bees became the humming choir of existence. And though there were bees and ghosts and memories to build a new idea of the future. The gray hive battered in the corner like a withered sun had no honey, but the mark of a shoe and the leak of uncertainty. Beautiful stuff, Melissa. Uh, your nerves didn't show at all, so well done. And uh, next up, we have Paul Talent. All right. <laughs> um, I haven't actually gave this a name, but I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, I've gone fucking mental in the middle of a dream. I'm trying my hardest, but I can't even scream. Instead, I hear a choir in the key of B flat, singing some shit that sounds like take that. Then, to make things worse, a familiar voice says, honey, a turn and a seer, the bitch that took my money. Awake in a panic and I feel superstition. My dreams, in a way, appear to be premonition, influenced by ghosts that haunt me from the past. I'm always the guy to find out last. Thanks, Paul. She was some bitch, all right, but sure, what can you do? Dreams, where do they come from? So now from one rather fantastic accent to another, who also happens to be a person, sorry about that there now, Paul, more than just an accent, to another lady with fantastic accent. Next up, we'll have Pam Campbell. Thank you. 
glad to follow such a beautiful accent. Um, fog marched over riverbed, gray white ghost in formation, marching to the rat a tat tat of B flat. Smoke on an unhearing, unseeing earth. My granny, kin to premonitions, salted the door, stoked the fire, and drew me close. They've come for the honey tongued ones, child. To save our souls, a holy choir marches tonight. Rat a tat tat, rat a tat tat. <laughs> Beautiful stuff, Pam. Thank you very much. And next up, and Cornelia, please. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't have a it doesn't have a title. This year's honey might have a runny texture and a dark taste, dark like the sound of a choir piece sung at nightfall. Its cadence touched by premonition, a shade of what's to come, brought on by the soft steps of ghosts like whisperings in B flat. They fade into the runny texture and the dark taste of this year's honey. Thank you, Cornelia. And now we'll have Doc Jenny. Sorry, Doc, you're, you're mute for now. I'm just going to unmute you there. There we go. Uh, my poem contains uh, the word rotomel instead of honey. Rotomel is a, is a uh, substance made from uh, raw honey and the fresh pressed ju juice of roses. So I have a premonition of poetry exhaled in a rich velvety sigh, becoming more real than real midst the rotomel savor flowing across all the worlds, new and old, and those which never were, of a ghostly Arios choir singing in the key of B flat, in a music which is never not there, as it converges and diverges across the infinite cusp of possibility and improbability. So we might hear what others cannot, as it flows mind to mind in the eternal immorality of beauty. Thank you. Lovely stuff, Doc. Thank you very much. What was that word again for, for, for honey? Rhodomel, R-O-D-O-M-E-L. It's a very ancient compound. It's been used as, as, a, uh, as a healing agent, and it's also been used as a cosmetic, uh, among other things. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So next up, we will have Michelle Delay, please. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Do you remember it? The boy on your laps. Your knees pointed together, cupping his head. The premonition, it's been melting over the years, spilling over the edge of my desk, still as glistening as a string of honey. The ghost of the boy in the painting became real in bits and pieces. His shoulder first, then his chunky little legs. The choirs of instinct filled up my sleep the night he arrived. A B-flat was x on the centre of my staff, denoting the key I live in without him. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Michelle. That was lovely. And now we will have Colm Scully. Hi, can you hear? Yep. Um, I was at the uh, the, hi the haiku uh, workshop there uh, last week, and um, uh, in in kind of kilty at spoken word. So I'm I'm in the in the short poem uh, uh, kind of mood. Uh, this is called daydream. Ghostly choir of honeybees, swarm to the world's last hive, buzzing a funerary dirge, in B flat. A premonition. Sure. 
short and not so sweet and let's hope not a premonition but thanks very much um, great stuff and next we will have molly to me <laughs> okay um it's not great but i'll make you listen to it anyway um i never wanted to be in the choir but miss lane kept dragging me back as if she could see the ghost crawl out my throat when I let out a C major, C flat, as if she hid in her honeyed hair, a premonition of all the times I'd panic attack on bathroom tiles that could be cured if I opened my lips and let out a roar. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Rawr. Let out those roars, everybody. We want to hear them. So next up, we will have Massimo, please. Hello, uh, this is my first five word challenge. So I, I made a mistake. I thought you just wanted to want us to write a poem of five words. So next time I'll get it right. But this is called True Story. I'm trying to quit smoking. <laughs> <laughs> I have so Thank been you. there. Sorry, I'll, I'll get it right next time. Well done. It's, it's a good one anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Massimo. And uh, next we will have Lauren O. Donovan. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the kitchen's fed, the dog is scrubbed. Finally, I sit down with a cup of tea and honey. Suddenly, the long, lonesome wail of a baby pierces me with premonition. With relief, I realize the noise is not a baby but a choir of cats engaged in feline orgy. My mistake was tempting fate, was thinking oh so magical, but it was summoned from my open book when I dared to page my novel. A ghostly mom calls out and haunts the corners of the house with perfect pitch in that B flat tuned to my maternal station. Fuck it, I'll just pretend I can't hear her. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And now we'll have Ada, Ada Miles, please. Yeah, yeah. And I wrote a poem in B flat. Uh, there will be a tricky. Oh, no, no, no. I'll explain it later. OK. Um, uh, no, it doesn't work like that. I'm just trying to get a B flat on my keyboard, on my synthesizer, so that I can sing the right key when it comes to sing. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got it. Uh, that premonition I've been getting this evening. When I get tired, I'll turn the track on. I'll headband. I'll head forward into chaos again. Let's be flat in a choir. Be flat. Let's be flat in a choir. Be flat. Don't be shy. A honey, a ghost, a honey ghost. Never sound. Always loud. Never sound. Ruin that flat. Be flat. Be flat. Let's be flat in a choir be flat and so on i don't know you can go on like that <laughs> so thank you thanks ada i think that's the choir that might actually accept a few of us <laughs> uh, good stuff so next up we'll have a sue blue thanks that was very capturing experimental poetry there ada okay um Right. The autumn colors sway the trees. The wind blows through the lanes, red and honey colored leaves along the tree lined way where darker clouds are rising now. As dooming as a choir chord rising in a B flat note up high into the nipping air. Where the premonition, where cumulus gray the premonition of rain drives the walkers to hide by the trees the cold pinches in we wrap our scarves tighter their fluttering ends hovering with us like ghosts getting lost in the winds that's it lovely stuff thank you sue and now we will have dan johnson please Hi guys, how are you? Uh, this is called The Modern Composer to His Modern Composer Wife. I just had a premonition. No, was visited by a revenant. 
Was it something of the future or the past? Either way, this is what we'll do. The 21st century suite, 2020 happy sad. Honey, tune the piano to B flat. We're reworking Vivaldi, down tune him like we're Cannibal Corpse. Rock the Beach Boys minor key, the, the choir not knowing if they're coming or going. And we'll end it all on the soft ghost of a note fading into the notion did this ever even happen at all? Thanks. Thank you, Dan. And now we'll have Philip Spillan. Everyone, am I coming in loud and clear? Cool, cool, cool. I'm gonna jump right into it. Bees that buzz in B flat minor make the worst sort of honey. My daddy, kin of the beekeepers, tuned up the buzzing vibrations, gained the choir beating to a B major. It was never easy. It was like understanding the feeling of deja vu or strange premonition. I don't know how he did it. He visited a farm and with his sitar, chime and hypnotize the bees to sync up. Now, five years on, honey does not taste the same. B flat minors all over the place. I swear I found a batch of bees that clearly buzzed a B sharp major seven, yuck. Then again, are now hollow beehives out in Bandon, all abandoned. Farm, sorry, at 12 at midnight, I hear a ghostly chime of, of a sitar of my daddy buzzing. Thanks for listening. <laughs> My handwriting again. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. And now to finish off the five word challenge, we'll have Catherine Ronan, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I call this poem Premonition. New primary school choir, straight as a board in short pants. I look at the pursed lips of Miss Honey, red oasis all the rage in a sea of white ghost foundation. Be flat, she hollered. I burst my lungs. She whispers in my ear, up the back and mime, dearest. Just like my premonition, destined to sing alone in my dreams, until I found my voice at 40. Fick you, Miss Honey. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. So you guys, you have heard 15 poems. I oh, know it's mine. Oh yeah. Huh? Oi. Oi, Mags, did you put your name in the chat? I forgot, to, I forgot to press send just, oh, I'd like to look at the time. We do, of course, yeah. One more, I, Mags Creedon. I'm so busy listening. I, I, I will throw my top and safety and work in. Be flat out, confront those ghosts. The critics who chant your toast, the choir of speculative voices. Sure, that spectre, after all, haunts us all. Banish the baggage, the bagage, the premonitions of things undone. Saddle up for your recovery mission. Discover that other world that lies within the nocturnal recess of dreams. Tucked away, emerge after that crap old day and bust a move. Take chances, paint fantasies, stylize your world in vivid color, shape the landscape, the world that suits the other words. Recast it, remap it. There's a tear in an oak where you're forever young and Carl Jung and you're very zen. Tear in a mala, you're flowing in a land of milk and honey and it's yummy bathing it. Tear in a spadoga where the robins come to rewrite your score, retrack your soundtrack. Listen to the new kicking beats of your soul. Be flat, be your own bar garage band, reproduced, remastered, unwound. Be your very own personal baggage lost and found. Be your own final edit. Be not a Ferrari, but be a funky Morris Minor. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Mags. Sorry, I nearly missed you there. I didn't see your name. I'm sorry, I didn't press in. <laughs> I was last in, all right. So we can get voting. And also, you folk on Facebook, you're very welcome to put your votes 
in the Facebook chat and we will record those names there. So you can put winner and the name of the poet. So I'm going to list out the name of all the people that read just to refresh your memories in case you may have forgotten somebody. So there was Melissa Marino, Paul Talent, yeah, Anne Campbell, Cornelia, Doc Janning, Michelle DeLay, Colm Scully, Molly Toomey, Massimo, Lauren O, Ada Miles, Sue Blue, Dan Johnson, Philip Spillan, Catherine Ronan, and Max Creedon. So cast your votes. Woohoo! Um, Melissa Moreno. Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm in there with them. You can see Paul here is busy tallying them up. That's his job. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I'd be going demented if I had to try and pick up all those names. Hi, Michael and uh, Afric. You're looking very Andy Warhol tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's. Ticks flying down on a piece of paper beside me here. Tensions mounting. Somebody else has four. Oh. <laughs> 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 Bring on the Facebook. I'm just checking Facebook now. I see somebody wants to join Ada's choir. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we have Richard Hawtrey watching. Hi, Richard. How are you? Time. Not yet. People do two, it's half each. Okay. You have to. Thank you very much. You with me? Yeah. So that's that's actually three and a half there. Okay. That's four. And Joanne, We're that's nearly there now, lads. And lassies. Right. And those that are neither. Okay, so the votes are in and some of you put down two names. So what happens if you vote for two people is they get half a vote each. Which means that Catherine Ronan, you had three and a half. Whereas Michelle Delay had four. So there was half a point between you. But Michelle Delay, you are tonight's winner. So <laughs> Oh, okay. sure, Lord, save us. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm, to get to I'm actually being hurt. Shit, if I'm mute. Thanks, Mags. That's great. <laughs> That's great, Michelle. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Mags. <laughs> Myself, and my. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, the Lord might save us. You never know. Um, Michelle, Lay, take it away. Thanks, Ed. Do you remember it? The boy on your laps, your knees pointed together, 
cupping his head. The premonition, it's been melting over the years, spilling over the edge of my desk, still as glistening as a string of honey. The ghost of the boy in the painting became real in bits and pieces, his shoulder first, then his chunky little legs. The choirs of instinct filled up my sleep the night he arrived. A B-flat was X'd on the centre of my staff, denoting the key I'd live in without him. Thanks everyone, and thanks Catherine <laughs> as well. It was so close. Yeah, that was beautiful. And two books coming to you, and uh, you can help yourself to a drink if you're choosing from your friends, apparently. <laughs> it's actually written down here. <laughs> <laughs> Go fresh. Anyway, well done. And um, so now I'm just going to make a few little announcements before I introduce our guest poets, which I think is now a guest poet. But um, we will give you Yitzhak Sharma another few minutes to join us, but he isn't here yet. So Kubis, you might be holding the fort. Tutsil, as they say, but you're no better man. Okay, so a few announcements. So the Five Words Volume 8 Anthology, which is one of the prizes for the Five Words Challenge, is available in PDF form. And Paul is going to share the link with you there on, in the chat. And the Five Words International Poetry Competition is well underway. Um, the first prize for that is 750 euros, plus a glass award from Michael Ray, who you can see in one of the little windows there looking a bit like Andy Warhol. Um, fantastic volume artwork. eight anthology, which is one of the prizes for the five volts. Yeah, you might have had a bit of a, whatchamacallit, my voice and double there, sorry about that. And the second prize is 500 euros and the third prize is 250 euros. So it's well worth entering. And the words for this week as of the 13th, which is tomorrow, I believe, um, are test, sketch, compare, simple and tied. So you've got a little head start with those words there. And we have an audio archive also, and Paul will put that link up in the chat room. So if you ever want to look back on any old avails and listen, you can do that by following the link. Um, this event has also been recorded live, as you know, and being streamed to Facebook. Um, the world of crazy madness that we all love and hate, maybe not in such a good measure, but there you go. And um, so from this point, we are being recorded in MP3 also, which will then become part of the audio archives. So if you have a poem on the open mic later and you do not wish it to go out into the world, just let us know by telling us in the chat room and we'll take you off that MP3 and you won't. You're, you're, um, your, your in the inner world won't be shared with the rest of the world. Um, and of course, Oveil aims to maintain a safe space for writers. So we hope that this is a safe space and we understand that the chat is available to everybody to use. So you're welcome to speak to each other um, through the chat. And we ask that you are respectful of one another and nobody harasses anybody. And if anybody does feel like anybody is sending them anything abusive of any kind, please do let us know and we will deal with it as best we can. But obviously we hope we don't have to do that because we're all hopefully nice, respectful people. So our guests on Monday the 9th of November are Nidhi Zak Arya Epi, which is, she has two names and she will be reading with Michal McCann and they will be sharing the bill with another poet named Ashley O'Neill. Okay, and also, as we all know, this night is partly run on donations. So there is a donation button happening somewhere in the chat box. And we'd be very grateful for anything you can um, donate. But of course, if you don't have anything, there is no pressure. So poetry should be free and is free. But if you can, brilliant. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest poet. It would seem that Yujitsu Charma, Charma hasn't been able to make it. He's all the way um, in Nepal, so there could be any kind of problem, I guess, with the cable lines and internet and who knows, but 
unfortunately we won't have the bits of Sharma unless of course he arrives while Kubis is reading and then we can put him at, in afterwards. But we are not uh, going to miss. We have a very fantastic poet here tonight. I've heard him read myself some years ago and it really did blow my mind. He's a really lovely writer and a great reader of his own work. Um, Kubis Moolman. And yes, a very erudite man. He is a professor of creative writing in the Department of English Studies at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. So he's coming to us from a very far away place. And he's right here in the room. How amazing is that? Um, he's published seven collections of poetry, two collections of plays, and edited a collection of poetry, prose and art by South African writers living with disabilities. He has won numerous local and international awards, including the Ingrid Jonker Prize, the Panza Award, the South African Literary Award, the Dalro Poetry Prize, I'm not going to say the next one because I won't say it properly, but another prize. And the 2015 Glenna Luche Award for African Poetry for his collection, A Book of Runes. His first poetry collection of short fiction, The Swimming Lesson and Other Stories, was published in 2018. So that was his first collection. So since 2018, he has written seven more. That's quite amazing. No, of short fiction. Of short fiction. Sorry, sorry. Excuse me. Thanks, Paul. He recently edited a special issue on contemporary South African poetry for the American journal Illuminations. And in 2019, he published a chapbook of meditative poetry with drawings by Shubnam Khan, All and Everything, by Hulanga Press. His new collection of poetry, The Mountain Behind the House, from which you will read, is due to be released in early November. And you have the links again in the chat for, for Kubis's books and for these collections. So please put your virtual hands together for Kubis Moolman. Thank you, Kubis. Okay. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks very much for the introduction. Can you all can you all hear me? Yeah, I don't want to speak too loud, um, but if you can hear me, then that's great. Um, yeah, uh, it really is absolutely wonderful to be back in Cork. Unfortunately, it has to be remotely. Um, yeah, but uh, my spirit is is upstairs in the room, enjoying. Thank you. Likewise, enjoying the poetry and the whiskey. Um, so I'm going to be reading some poems from. Um, my new collection, the collection that will be launched, it'll be launched in exactly a month, in a month's time on the 12th of November. Um, I can arrange links and send those to you if you want to attend that particular launch. Uh, yeah, um, or whatever. Um, and then I'll also, and then I'll also be reading some new yeah, some some new poems. I can try if I can share the screen. Uh, uh, no, okay, never mind. I was going to show you the cover, but that doesn't. That's neither here nor there. The most important thing is um, I'm going to read these poems. So the interesting thing is I've never read these poems anywhere. And actually, for me, it's quite special that I can share them the very, very first time with my friends in Ireland. And I mean that very seriously. So the collection is essentially poems that were written 
most of the poems were written from the middle of 2016 until probably the end of the end of last year. Um, up until that time, previous to 2016, I had been living in Peter Maritzburg in KwaZulu Natal. I'd lived in this in that city my whole life. And then four years ago, I just my wife and I decided to make the change and we've moved down to the Cape. We live in a small village in the Cape that is actually, the village is at the foot of a mountain. I've never lived beneath a mountain in my entire life before I visited mountains, but I've never known what it's like to live beneath a mountain. Um, uh, the mountain is called Castilberg, which is an Afrikaans, term um, which means castle mountain so so i live at the base of castle mountain um okay so is every can everyone still here is everyone fine all good <laughs> okay great okay the first poem is called new house There is no mountain at the front of the new house. There are only birds and thin fever trees. There are only small stones and the shouts of children. At the back of the new house is where the mountain lives. The mountain with its hard, high forehead the mountain with its infinite number of steps into the clouds. At the back of the new house, there is the mountain and small plants that survive only on air and yellow fish that change behind the curtain of the wind. The next poem is called Blue Door. Many of these poems, I think in my own, the, the way I, I think of them is, they're not stories, they're not, they're not telling a story, they're not narrative, they're very abstract marks. They are gestures in a certain sense, abstract gestures that try to leave some kind of echo. Um, so don't look for story, don't listen for story, listen for hooks rather, like a barbed wire fence. You're trying to struggle through the barbed wire fence and as you reach through the fence, it hooks onto your jumper, even better still if it hooks onto your skin. Okay, blue door. All is still. Sky bangs a blue door in the face of burning rock. Barely birds move, small high stones through air dry as sunlight. I'm shadow, sheltered in the stoop of a small tree. I'm salt, the tastes of seeing. Old bone, cracked beneath the weight of insects. I should say, if at any point I'm reading too fast, then you didn't get the poem or you couldn't hear it just stop and I will, I will gladly gladly read the poem again this poem is called he does not know it's a kind of mantra actually for me he does not know he does not know what he is doing or why he is doing it why it is so early where he is and so late where he is not. Why the sky where he is is so big 
and so limited at the same time. Why there are so many mountains, or why there are any mountains at all? He does not know the answer to any of the questions anymore. He is no longer able to think of even the simplest things. Where to pay for water, for example, or how to buy time. This is a poem called, I Carry a Geography. Um, it, it's a poem, quite a, f a, few, a few years ago, I spent a month, two months, in, I spent two months in Calgary, in Canada. And this is a poem, this is a love poem I wrote. I carry a geography for Julia. I carry a geography of the dark with me across oceans, frozen lakes, mountains whiter than ice, where wind contours a need urgent as flesh. This dark, this dark I know that does not ever ever even in the glare of dreaming leave me this recognition familiar and strange as any echo returning white across a frozen sea this dark is you as long as you like the dark carry absence in the shape i carry with me everywhere the geography of a heart in two halves. Okay. This poem is called um, The Dripping. There is a dripping in my head. Mother says she was always the largest girl in her class at school. A flock of sacred ibises erupt from a tree. The neighbor hoots for his wife to come and open the motor gate for him. Someone has turned off the water at the mains in the street again. Mother says the only thing she ever won at school was the St. John's ambulance badge for best bandage technique. The wind has died down and the fires on the hillside at last are out. I can see the thin blue sky again. There is a dripping in my head. Mother left school in standard five to work in her parents' fish and chip shop at the end of West Beach in Prince Alfred. Those are not clouds anymore. Those are no longer trees. Someone has pulled out the plug from the bottom of the ocean and I'm being sucked into the current. Mother says she was an only child and both her parents were adopted. My pockets are filling up with syringes and with sand. My pockets are filling up with surgical masks. I have to write something, anything, anything so just so as not to hear the dripping in my head. Thank you. Okay. 
These are some really weird poems. There's some really weird shit going on here. And as I go on, it's going to get more weird. I might have to stop. No, well, I will stop, but before then. This is called Wall. The wind comes in the night when everybody is asleep and builds a wall between the sky and gravity. When we wake and walk in the forest of tall gum trees, smelling the eucalyptus and the wet earth, we do not notice how much the sound of leaves is like bricks being tossed up to the second story where the loud light lives. Yeah. This is unfortunately not a, a particularly nice poem to read. Um, unfortunately, there's a scourge of gender based violence and child abuse that is rampant, particularly here in this province in the Western Cape. Um, the various socio-economic reasons. This is called Little Girl. Her grandmother sits on the green plastic chair with the broken back. Her mother sits on an upturned black label beer crate. Her sister sits and sleeps on her mother's lap. Her auntie, on her mother's side, sits on the stump used for chopping wood and for chopping off the heads of chickens. Her mother's disabled cousin sits in her wheelchair, the one with the stupid front wheel. Her father hasn't been seen for three years since he left to find work on the citrus farms near Clan William. She sits on the bare earth with her legs crossed and her blue school skirt tucked tight beneath her legs in case her father should ever come back. Okay, who? Who is the one who opens and closes the heavy gate so that the fully laden truck can drive through and out the other side? Who is this person whose job it is to step out into the heat barefoot to grasp the hot metal of the gate and heave it open and then close it again? Who is this person? Tell me. Is it the one who sits in the back? Is it the one who always sits behind? The one who always has to peer between the shoulders of everyone else? in order to see the world. Rosie, I, I, I've completely lost track of time. I meant to start timing myself and, and I didn't. So just... There's absolutely no stress or pressure on time, Kubis. Um, I think everybody would love you to read for longer. I know I would. And seeing as Yuyitsu isn't with us, that means you have free reign to go as overtime as you like. Thank you. I have a few, yeah, just a few more. 
thanks. So the poems I read then were poems that will be in this new collection coming out in a month's time. But I can't sit still while I, yeah, I sit still too long. So I have to keep writing. So, so here's some pieces that are, um, I'll probably say still in transition, transition, yeah. Okay, they're still coming in, coming, coming into space, I think. But there's enough of them here that I think can warrant a reading. Um, that I think they're strong enough to be able to stand by themselves. So I'll try a few of them. Wind again. The wind again is turning all of the trees inside out. Same wind that is slamming every door shut behind me. I can no longer use my arms to walk or even roll. And yet the steadfast mountain persists in its slowness. And it's the same illustrated sky as before and still. Drilling down deeper, now the only direction to go. I want to just repeat that last stanza just for myself, basically. Drilling down deeper, now the only direction to go. Drilling down deeper now, the only direction to go. Okay. <laughs> here's, a, here's a goodie. It's called animal. I am an animal made of hands and of mouth. I pant all over. I am sticky and I stink with stickiness. I lick everything, even the light, the tastes of wet and hungry. <laughs> so sometimes when it, one ends up laughing at one's own stuff, uh, it's nice. It's rare, but what does it's yeah. I laugh. I laugh at that one. This is called facial recognition. I should laugh at this, but I know I'm not going to. Every day, uh, okay, it's a, it's a prose poem, so it comes in a prose, in a pro, in prose shape. <clears throat> Every day he feels himself to be a different person. Just yesterday, the last day of the old year, he went to the bathroom in the seaside hotel where he and his wife were having lunch. He had already had three glasses of sweet white wine. And he looked at himself in the bright bathroom mirror that ran the length of the one wall. And he thought himself old and fat and ugly. This morning he walked past the image of himself in the window of the small town butcher shop. He was not the same person as yesterday. He was not younger or thinner or more handsome, of course. But there was something different about him. Was it the flies crawling across his lip and his shaved head? Was it the crows cawing inside his ears, the empty pages flapping behind his eyes. And now, at this moment, now he looks at his stiff, 
and creaking hands, and he does not recognize them. They look like a rusted farm implement tossed into the felt behind a shed. A strange implement for separating skin from flesh. I have two more, and then we'll, we'll call it a night. His grand, this is called his grandfather's toolbox. Does a heart beat here inside, the man asked, and he banged the old wooden box, the box that his grandfather stored his old tools in, the tools to repair his old orthopedic boots. And if there is a heart here, he asked, as he counted the loud feet of the pedestrians and counted the loud feet of the old oak tree as he banged the old wooden box of his ribcage, then can I, can I trust my blood still? Can I trust my old hands to keep the lid shut so that nothing leaks out? The last poem is called Final Story. And the final story is about the man who could neither bend his back nor turn his neck. The man who could not stop leaking cerebrospinal fluid from every orifice of his body. The man who could not take a step without wading through the sticky, thick liquid. His body was neither able to keep in nor to stop producing. The man at last, whose only movements left to him were those of his wide open eyes and his black tongue. Thank you, sure. Thank you very much. And John Matt Magnus. Thank you. Easy. Nice, that was very, very enjoyable. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kubus. That was, as the ladies said, amazing, really powerful, even more powerful than I, I remembered. And I would say to you, it's be nice to maybe have a little look in the chat room because lots of people were, um, leaving little comments there as you were reading. I'll read out one or two and then you might want to go back and look over them yourself. Lovely poem, um, in case her father should ever come back. So people sometimes write up lines that strike them uh, fantastically powerful, somebody else said. And um, yeah, where is it? I'm sure I'll be down here. Great poems, great punches, screams of enjoyment. So. Thank you, Kubus. And uh, before you started reading, you mentioned whiskey. So I quickly switched my tea for a whiskey. And I'd like to raise this glass to you and to everybody else in the room that might have a glass, a cup of tea, anything in your hands. Let's raise, raise a glass to Kubus. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you. It's been, it's been very special for me to be able to read these poems, to try them out tonight. And uh, so thank you for your reaction because it's it's warming to be able to realize that one hasn't got yet to the bottom of the well. I know, and I'm, I, no, <laughs> certainly not. Thank you, Kubo. It's really, really fantastic. So, take a little breathe in and a little breathe out. Breath out, even. I keep getting my words all jumbled on a poetry night, which is brilliant, obviously. So, right, the next part of the night is our open mic. So for you guys, we've all been sitting there listening. It's your time to share your words with us. And if you would like to, I hope some of you will, I'm sure some of you will, 
And if you do want to, you just put open mic and your name in the chat room and we will compile a list here. Um, I think we generally go for a maximum of 30, 35 people. So I think, I think we'll be okay tonight. And we seem to be good for time. So people have between, between one and two poems, I think. No great big epics now, they're like 10 pages long, you know, not two of those, <laughs> one of those. <laughs> okay, so we will start the, the evening with um, somebody who's left some lovely comments via Kubis, if you, if you, I don't know if you're going to check those, but um, Pam Campbell, please, you can stop that the open mic okay um my mother excuse me my mother is my mother is a ghost town condemned and boarded up where insurance burns carve gaping vacancies she is where people gathered and roared the night she killed the renegade where i saw her before she was lost to fire she is the wide welcoming avenue soul sucking welfare depression, the hooker, the alcoholic, struggling and dying. Sometimes my mother is Doris Day in Rock Hudson in Saturday morning dime shows where popcorn is free. Sometimes she's the canal, clean and full, the breeze rippling clarity and holy water. Sometimes she's skipping on sidewalks. She's bulging with life, breaking through her cement shroud. She is the fog lifting ice cold feet off bruised dewy grass. She is smooth and brown with hair as black as coal, full of mystery, sword play and song. She is whole, no longer vacant by choices made for and by her. She is full of light and comfort. My mother is forever lost in time and all that held her memory exploited and stripped of her treasure that I torn from her early embrace still seek. Mm, that was fantastic, Pam, thank you. I just got distracted there with um, admission somebody. <laughs> um, so next up, could we have Francis Column, please? Column. Hello. Um, I think I was last time I was here, uh, I did a poem about uh, an alabaster bust. Um, I'll just find a picture of it to prove that I do have an alabaster bust that uh, I found that I bear an uncanny resemblance to. There he is. <laughs> uh, I've <laughs> Another poem about that one. Um, it's a short poem, this one though, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll just bring it up. Uh, right. Gloveless. After visiting the British Museum, I meet a man who tells me alabaster absorbs fingerprints. That's why curators wear white cotton gloves. I think of all the times I've handled you govelessly, all those fingerprints drunk up by our thin, semi permeable flesh. My careless marks, your headaches. Could a forensic archaeologist split open your head and identify me? Or was it simply a figure of speech I simply accepted at face value? Still, I'm sorry for touching you. Those sebaceous cysts that crawl, the knotted migraines that pool like a tenuous metaphor. As I try to get my head around it, the sense we made. Still, I'm just as clueless as you, and dumb. That's the end of that one, thanks. Thanks, Francis. Um, next up, we'll have Kemi George Simpson, please. Sorry, hello. Um, I'm just finding the poem. All good. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I thought because it's Black History Month, I'd just read something that has a bit of a theme of that. So um, this is a poem called The Migrant and the Bin Man. Um, so, late again, robe draped migrant, tights tied on top of her head, shelter, sheltering braids, hard to get the bush out of the girl even in carrig tool, feeling like the black in a negative stereotype, hoping for compassion. The uproar as startling as the odour, but safe on paved roads, a non-military vehicle approaches. He casually carts the refuse, overlooking the indisputable stench. And yet she is the curiosity. She drags it from the garden, up the side of the house onto the road, then mimics an African sprinter, retrieving kitchen cluttering excess, rubbish that does not need to dwell in open sewers. Surrounded by clatter and clutter, his patience overwhelms. She wells up with gratitude's tears. No more can be accommodated in this limited container. Weeks of waste have found rescue, emptying space for more exhausted essentials. People hope for dignity and a redeeming end, but the path of those who seek asylum is cursed for so many, like waste being disposed of. He quietly takes the wheelie bin from her hand, and then affably agrees to take more crap from her. A relaxed generosity stills anxiety. She feels indebted, though the bin bill is paid. Maybe her hue and history invoke guilt, or maybe he's just kind. She was a professional organizing a class in the syllabus with ease, her household chores of vicious wars fought by fought family members. The scale and persistence of daily tasks defeat the dejected. They will meet again early morning amidst the multicolored garbage. Neighbors will punctually pattern pavements with appropriate wheelie bins. Hers may never be punctual and will predictably overflow. Some will meet this with their justified contempt, apathy, offspring to the unworthy. The bin man is cautious. He has a tendency to meet the migrant with a thoughtful generosity. Oh. Thank you, Kemi. And next up, we'll have Lauren O. Thank you very much. So this one is a bit of a work in progress. So I'm hoping by reading it out to you guys, I'm going to be inspired as to what final edits need to be made. So here we go. It's called Goethe Drislig, which is in Irish, and it means field of thistles. Kerry Monday, questions print, garden meat, solicitor, paper notice, phone neighbor, certs and copies, call engraver, pub deposit, aunts and uncles. I feel you sitting outside the back door on that cast iron metal chair, back to back cigarettes burning away, your head in your hands until you notice me. Then you sit up and take a drag and ruffle your forehead as if to straighten the thoughts, your eyes bloodshot and sunk like you haven't slept since you died. You manage a half smile and ask, all right, love, Text auctioneer, whiskey, brackets, willy, collect ashes, meet engineer, Gertrude Drislig, sell motorbike, scan signature, price skip, charity clothes, gut attic. The scarf was yours, but I'd never seen you wear a scarf. It was up around your neck in such a way that I expected a cigar and brandy to be in the box with you. But all that was in there was you, that red and white patterned scarf trimmed with black and whatever else you were wearing, I can't remember. All I could see was the scarf, or should I say an ascot tie, as I was later informed. Thanks, Bobby. Inquest report, pay St. James, probate court, sale documents, copy deeds, carry last trip, Banna Beach, keys hand over, pack and post, flight Vancouver. But when I needed you most, you still came straight from the grave and not even a real grave, but a box full of ash in a hole in a wall. You come to me in the rain as I dance and I cry, headphones blasting, drowning out reality with nothing else existing other than what is now within me. You get up on the planters and railings and dance like the whole city can't see you and the rain falls straight through because it doesn't know that you were there, but I do. We dance until I can't tell what is wet from what and the end notes of pumped up kicks echo in the nudie bursts of silence in my head. Thanks. 
Thanks, Lauren. Excellent stuff. Yeah, great. And um, next up, we'll have Colm Scully, please. Hi, sorry, uh, I um, I wasn't ready there. Um, I, I, as I said there, I was at the haiku um, workshop the other night, so I'm kind of into haikus so at the moment. Uh, there was a number of people on there actually at it. I know that uh, Margaret and Mags. Um, so here's a couple of haikus, and they're all COVID related, not to, not to get the press around, but they're all COVID related haikus, just, just a few of them. Com communion dress twirls in the Halloween section. Everything out of season. Winter edges in over the lonesome houses. Pubs closed again. Outside a COVID church, you receive communion. Wind catches the host twice. Thanks, Colin. And Excellent colour. We have Ada Miles. Um, sorry. That's me already. <laughs> so fast. I didn't. Uh, oh no, I accidentally closed the poll and I was. It's gonna. Uh, could you go back to me in, uh, after the next reader? Sure. I, just, no I, I accidentally closed everything. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay. So okay. instead, we will have Margaret O'Regan if you're ready. Um, what I'm going to do is read this one again. It's The Devil Wears Debenhams. It's an acrostic poem and the reason being that tomorrow the Debenhams workers are being dragged through the courts in the four courts of Dublin. Um, the, the receiver for Debenhams, KPMG, are endeavouring to get an injunction to prevent them from entering any of the premises. They've entered three so far and they've only stayed for three nights and come out again uh, very peacefully and very safely. Anyway, um, the devil wears Debenhams. These Debenhams workers have paved the way every minute of every day. Dignified women and men are they. Evil devils in Debenhams they face. Villainous vultures in boardroom culture imagine they can with their despicable plan lorded over the workers they slammed. But workers thrown on the scrap heap erupt and fight back, everyone so determined in this first COVID strike. A win for these workers is a win for us all, refusing to kowtow, not taking a fall, staying the course in all 11 stores. Debenhams directors, contemptible, covetous cretins, each and every one a grasping, avaricious louse. By standing up together, wherever they gather, every one of these workers will go hell for leather. Non-ending solidarity at home and far afield has enveloped these brave fighters in a force field and revealed a strength and revelation so supremely divine, making them the spearhead of revolt during COVID, standing firm and steadfast in face of corporate greed. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Long may they stand. And um, you might let us know if there's any kind of a fund in case they do get, you know, have to pay money or whatever. Anyway. Um, so we will go back now to Ada Myers, if you're ready. Are you ready, Ada? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm ready. I was just yeah. typing in, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, so if we're going covered poems, I have one covered poems. I, I just wrote it when I was really angry because in Ukraine we're having piking up figures of stats because of people not wearing masks or believing in magic. When I'm like that, when I'm like that, when I'm like that, I don't know how do they use condoms and I'm really wondering because many people around and many people without masks, I hate that. So it's an angry poem called Cover Your Face. Cover your face, that means you, that means nose too, that means yeah, face, all of it please, or else it will spread, ah, make me mad with such ease. 
And as it was a short poem, I'll do another poem also about hate, actually, but this time it's about a vacuum cleaner. Uh, well, I, I just imagined a vacuum cleaner and happy. Uh, it just came to me as one image and I, and I dug into it and I thought, what would be that life like? And it's a short poem anyway. A vacuum cleaner. Oh yeah, and it's an experiment because I never used slant rhymes before. And I decided to use slant rhymes here. A vacuum cleaner hates its life because of course it sucks. No punctation to her cause to sort of highlight facts. A vacuum cleaner damns its life as vacuum cleaner grafts as dawns to evenings and to nights turn shamelessly in shifts. A vacuum cleaner prays to Claude, the god of cleaner stock, that soon his being, please be seized, his honor is a freak. And it's ambiguous too, so we can sort of play around with how you understand a poem. <laughs> That's all. Thank you, Ada. Thanks. I actually changed the Hoover bag today, so you... Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad. To have been uh, of relation. <laughs> um, Righty-o. So now we will have Dan Johnson, please. Hi, guys. Hey. Um, the only thing that she uh, might benefit from knowing in this poem is the word um, skitch, which is like this skateboarding term for when you grab onto a car while you're skateboarding and you kind of let yourself be towed by the car. I've never done it. Uh, just seen it. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, it's called Parking Lot. There we are, emerging from the trail, as though the shady wooded path connecting our neighborhood to the back of Fieldstone Shopping Center were a womb, a suburban chrysalis filled with the myths of marijuana, Bud Light, and blowjobs. We're walking out of the bushes passing past the dumpsters through the parking lot to the down under cafe braving the post-apocalyptic apocalyptic tarmac haze of the parking lot in summertime we watch the loitering teenagers kick flip off the low curb they smoke cigarettes wear beanies despite the mid-july heat one of them dressed in all black sketches a mom's hatchback as she drives towards the exit he passes us crouched on the skateboard, hand gripping the underside of the bumper, his face pimpled, pale and wild in the act. I think of how hot the car metal must be. Even then I have a sense of impropriety, aware of the trick is what my father would refer to as a bonehead move. The mom breaks, gets out, blonde and screaming, and the kid hops off the board and rejoins his friend on the curb. What the hell do you think you're doing? She's shaking, outraged. The sun glints violently off the storefronts, glass windows, the broadsides of parked cars. And I have a feeling that that's not a question that anyone in the parking lot has an answer to. That it's not a real question at all. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Can you see Pam has left a comment there? Tarma Kays and Pimpled Pale in the act. People are riffing off your poem there. And next we will have the lovely Susanna Trifoletti, please. Oh, you'll need to unmute yourself there, Susanna. Good stuff. Okay, so this poem is called uh, The Half Night. I steal the cigarette from between your fingers for a puff for the sake of flirting. I don't smoke either. The soft blanket on that white morning in my bedroom and the obstination of my dog's breath under the door. Did you really bring that stinky chicken roll in the bedroom? The noise of the plantago's heads are bumping on the plastic of my sandals. A snare drum announcing my feet. You're the last man I saw asleep. The last deep voice I laughed with when the drunk man fell asleep on his sandwich in Lennox. Those two pigeons we circled up in the cold night were balancing on a thick wire. How do they do that? Did they choose each other or they just join together for the sake of warmth? I don't close my eyes when nakedness surprises me and I'm balancing my weight on the mattress next to you. 
pondering the shades of your ginger hair, the cliche of meeting a musician one night. I love Mingus too, and wow, that story of the clown, that could be me, trying to keep the hates of our laughter so that I don't lose your, your undivided attention. I'm half awake of my wire, and fearing the morning arriving too soon, I notice a polite stranger in my bed. I watch you brushing your teeth and gently folding your toothbrush in the cellophane. You do it as if, you're, as if you were handling a delicate flower, a dear picture from when you were a child. You're gone in the gray and cold Sunday morning under a night that wanted more out of lovers and a moon that was so small and clear to be picked like a pea. Thank you, Susanna. Very good. Thank you. Um, Thank you next up, we'll have Catherine Ronan. Hi. Um, I wrote this poem for the late Derek Mahan. It's a short poem. It's called We Share the Night. You get up, brother, make the day look easy. I have been sweeping words into the wind all night. I am your ambition in a dress, catching the earth, left-handed. Moon in the soul, mouth open, I comb your hair, sing you to sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's nice to remember Derek Mahan. Yeah. He was, he's a, an elderly poet, a really brilliant poet, who passed away last week or the week before. So, Nice to remember him, Catherine. Thanks for that. Uh, next, we will have Mags Creedon, please. Hi. Um, it's a tiny bit dark because we were writing the subject of penance, and I've it's a little bit of a recurrent theme about disenfranchised children. My own know, have known love and have used their chances, and this is just for the other children. So I'll break into song at the end if I can. But. Um, penitential hints. In hobnail boots and short pants, Unsoggart gave him penance, made him divulge wicked thoughts, queer dreams and nicking threepence. Says he, some sins are unforgivable. Don't violate a sanctum nor dance in a loved one's grave nor succumb, young man, to the carnal. Alas, the young boy speaks. Bless me, Father, for a whip to barley twist, a penny bar, some of the golf ball chewing gums and the gobstoppers from the plastic goldfish jars told a porky to the teacher. Took a spin on Conjo's bike, but there's a grand view from the big bridge and standing on the pedals on the high nail issue, I'm like Bin Hur's finest image. Remember the big long words of confession. Oh my God, I'm heartily sorry. Ten our fathers and Hail Marys, jail the cardinals, the venial sins spared grudgingly. Out he goes on bony knees, kneels on a splinted kneeler. A dirty looks from God's archway. He reaches for his trusty stock, it's not right for his schnauzer. And he's there much longer than all the other penitents, because his penance list took way more time. Child, purgatory, limbo for the innocents. Seeing the furious fires below and the silver clouds above. The king of kings crown glitters where he'll never see it on his back street, starved of love. Little lost ones go to limbo where they play their waiting game. Waiting rank, a waiting number, so they'll fit in just the same. Stateless in their timeless place, faceless pass through ports. Can you file and save me? I'm gentle, I won't hurt. Mommy is the nanny state, Bernardi is my auntie. Robinson sometimes comes to the rescue. Heartbeats, wrong pace, wrong places. Cause there are so many lost ones. Some are wealthy beyond dreams. 
were impoverished by outdated codes. They're just like us, it seems. Free me from my fence of glass, from barbed wire, wire and window panes, from hard beds in rooms that hum and groan. Detention spans our pain. But I can dream of soft embraces of my name in a roll call. I can dream of loving faces who may find me after all. Chinawit. Thanks a million, Mags. Lovely singing as always. Um, so we have three more people left that have signed up, but I, I realize there are other people that haven't signed up. Have they signed up? Okay. Okay, well, okay. The one person that I, the question around is Melissa Massimo Moreno. Melissa Moreno. Um, if you'd like to read, you might put your name in the chat box. Oh, are you ready to read now? I did, I did. Okay, I great. Yeah. Um, I have two poems that I would like to share with you if that's okay. Okay. So the first one is um, is uh, an English version of a poem from my first published book. It's called La Piel de la Oruga, so it's uh, the skin of the caterpillar. Oh. Um, the, the title is Yellow Dust in the Night Wind to Sus. The house was filled with yellow dust. It was autumn. The lights of the last day were beating on the window. I faked my own absence with a roar, ferocious as the ones which are skinned when blood boils and streets darken. I was holding the tremor between my fingers animal in heat, when I brought the bodies together, the fragrance, the claspers of the sex, until my hands were cramped with their soft sequins. You came dodging the wires, a glider made of bone, of falling. You came to die inside your female, to spread your seeds over the earthquake before dropping to ashes or rags. But you couldn't, neither could I, find the veins of the leaves, the formula against forgetfulness. I give you back to the air with a kiss that I blow between your wings beyond your death. I caress the scar on the tree where you hid your soul, yellow, the bite of the flowers. I pour my eyes in the sky of fire Cadaver's pulp of older stars, like children who devour the flesh of their ancestors, their gesture. I tremble. You fade like the tree that disappears beneath its own shadow, lying in the sun. I write your trace on the poem's land. I open my hands, yellow dust in the night wind. I see you fly. And the other poem is um, from my third book, thanks, uh, The Joke, a tribute to Joker. So it's, um, it's a tribute to the film Joker. Bathroom dance. Run like wind tossing a coin towards the last door open to decide what's right or wrong. The fatherless night embraces the poor, the dark, the homeless. Fatherless creature run out of breath, fast as a shooting star, growing shadow of a man, such a clown, climbing up the wall, such a creeping fig, a giant, tossed to the wind, live behind the bonfires. Do not look back, never go back. Hold to your new pal, bang! And dance, 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 arms wide open. Seize your act of resurrection. Die as you were, broken. Kill that man. Make up your steady smile. My new face is peeping out. He's now looking at me. 
pain begins to glide and glow. Who pulls the strings of motion? Who pulls the trigger of fate? Nobody. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. It's great that you could join us all the way from Buenos Aires. And uh, yeah, hopefully, see you again. And next up. I hope so. Yeah. Brilliant, Melissa. Yeah. So next up, we will have Michelle Delay. Apologies, guys. I thought I was unmuted there, but I wasn't, and I was blabbing away into the ether. But um, I think Michelle might have just left the room for a minute because she was there a second ago, so no doubt she'll be back any minute now. So instead, we will have Sue Blue, Rosalind Blue. Okay, right. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, lovely to hear the poetry flowing. Um, yeah, we were talking at the beginning um, and someone uh, actually, uh, Doc Jannings mentioned the uh, old poem by uh, Goethe, Der Erlkönig, which uh, he um, worked with in his own schooling. And um, I did my own translation of that poem. Now, uh, this goes back again to my grandmother performing it in the kitchen and me becoming hooked to, I think, performance poetry. That's what it was, really. Um, she kept that poem in her mind, all in her memory all the time uh, from school to the end of her life. So um, I translated it earlier on, and um, I will just do the uh, English version because it's quite a long poem. Um, and um, yeah, I hope you like it. Um, this is my version. The Elfin King, who rides so late through the withering night. Is it the father with his dear child? He firmly holds the boy in his arm, gripping him safely, keeping him warm. My son, why hide your face in fear? Oh, father, the elf king, can you not see? The elfin king with his trail and crown. That's just a wisp of wind. That's just a wisp of mist, my son. My dear sweet child, come away with me. Most wonderful games I'll play with thee. By the beach grow many colorful flowers and you'll see my mother's golden gowns. My father, my father, and can you not hear what Elfin King is quietly promising me? Be calm, stay calm, my dear child. The wind is rustling dry leaves with a sigh. Oh, handsome boy, will you come with me? My daughters will take good care of thee. My daughters will lead the nightly round, will dance, sing and sway you until you sleep sound. My father and my father, and don't you see there the elfin king's daughters in their dark lair? My son, my son, I can see it quite sharp. The old willow trees shimmer grey in the dark. I love you. I, I'm charmed by your elegant poise. And if you're not willing, I'll take you with force. My father, my father, he's grabbing my arm. The elfin king has done me harm. The father is horrified, riding with haste, holding the groaning child firmly embraced, arrives at the court by the skin of his teeth. In his arms, the child had been taken by death. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sue. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, so. 
Michelle Delay, we missed you a little minute ago. So if you are ready now, we'd love to hear a poem from you. Thanks, Rosie. Sorry, I got cut off there for a sec, guys. Um, I'm going to read this poem. I want this one to be a little bit of a nod or a salute um, to, to the two women, Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara. Um, they're two architects of, of Grafton Architects who won the Pritzker Prize this year, which um, is often return, referred to as the sort of Nobel Prize equivalent. Um, and they're the they're fourth and fifth women to ever win it in 41 years. And there was only one other Irish recipient um, in 1982. So it's kind of something nice to be celebrated this year. So this poem, it's called, There Is No Such Thing As A Line. Um, it's just a nod to them. A line, a meaningless thing, not in or out of the realm of the real, we do not think in lines. It is on the verge of being unrendered a word, clutching at the roots of the flax seeds. For meaning, ever since the Latin line, line the coats of the woven linen, frequency in a zigzag, scribes the length and breadth of places heard. I remember where I went to when you sang. I remembered where I was when you stopped. A stroke of chalk on a blackboard spreads the compact shells of minute marine beings onto sheets of slate. It has a thickness, a layer of life lifted from a stick by the force of a shoulder, elbow or a wrist. Smeared never quite onto the stone, but staying nevertheless until stroked away. Line, even when born to pixels of light, stacked up or spilled across the screen in a space that consumes none. You share nothing with the crooked horizon until your axes collapse you to zero degrees, until you become obsolete. Thanks guys, and thanks for coming back to me, Rosie. <laughs> I'm very glad I did, indeed. Yeah, it's a beautiful poem. You should maybe try and send that to those ladies if you can. I'd say they'd be well chuffed to get it. Um, so now we have one, two, maybe three, four, five readers left. So if we could have Kieran McCarthy now, please. If you're ready, you ready? Yeah, what's the crack? Um, yeah, really. Can you can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Perfect. Um. Yeah. Really nice to hear your words, and it's really cool that there's so many people from all over, all over the spot, um. Able to contribute their words to the evening. Very, uh, very nice to hear you. Um, Buenos Aires and South Africa and all sorts of places. So, good to uh, do a bit of traveling in your imagination, even if you can't travel. Um. At the moment, this is a poem. Yeah, I probably wrote it a couple of weeks ago, maybe two or three, two or three weeks ago. <clears throat> I'm at eighty percent every time. Full steam ahead is called for. At sixty, I'm a coaster. One more paranoid boaster, looking over boat shoulders, clear as mud. I'm getting colder. Wouldn't be your martyred soldier to roll away your boulder. I can't wait till I am older. When you won't dare look at me like that. And I'm too good laughs off a heart attack and chewing flax for snacks. And then you won't be so robust with your who did what's and your there's that for that. Making a fuss and doling slaps. Go take a nap. Make entry through the swinging flap, rudimentary how your tittles tat. Spend a century spilling wax and never build a candle. Your mind's hung up on passing fat streams of flying off the handle. Wants only to lay low and flat and take pictures of the scandal. And I can't be making points afresh to suit your sharpened angle. Grapevine has it, you should head west where ideals tend to dangle.
Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Oh, yes, so we all need one of those every now and then. So we'll have Doc Jennings next, please. Doc Jennings. Okay. This is an Ars Poetica poem I wrote four years ago. Uh, in it, there's a reference to the Brides of Dawn, which uh, re makes reference to uh, the gods and goddesses of ancient cultures, uh, which sometimes included a goddess of the dawn. And once a year, they would have a ceremony in which the image of the uh, goddess of dawn would be married symbolically to the image of their primary god. So that's the reference. Poetry speaks of mysteries within the soul, mysteries no thought may uncover and no guess can reveal. It is a flame in the heart, an understanding of the whole and a step in the known toward the unknown. It is a flash of lightning and a never vanishing song chanted by the Brides of Dawn. It is a secret found between the thought in the poet's mind and the throb in the reader's heart. It arises when the secret thoughts of the poet and the manifestations of the multiverse become one. Until then, it hides in the poet's thoughts until it surrenders to paper. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. And next up, we will have Massimo Lavelle, please. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks again for having me. It's always a huge honor. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, with the child's affection, I look on my world in reflection. See, I still remember when heaven was never a place in some other dimension. Memories I rest my head in, looking back seem like an ancient invention. I seek for the place where they're kept in in search of the face that creates their impression. I speak from my heart in confession. I tried out my darkness for testing. The universe taught me a lesson by cleaning the garden that I made a mess in. Now, when I'm afraid of progressing, I'm guided by grace, though I pray for protection. Sometimes I'll wait for a blessing, but then it just comes when I don't pay attention. It's like someone above me who loves me or someone below me who knows me, like someone beside me, inside me, a part of a whole when seen wholly. Who handles my breath, makes my heart beat dance in my breast? Who takes my command when I rest and stays awake when I fold my hands on my chest? Who keeps me while I sleep? Who sows seeds I don't see but still reap? Who dreamed this world and gave me a peep just to embrace me back to the deep? But the world is still spinning, so I turn round and round just to fit in. I can't house the house that I live in, but where I am home is the house of the living. If even the heavens and earth did not exist to remember it from birth. Doubting the self, may the spell be reversed and question your purpose instead of your worth. They say to see the whole universe, I have to learn to see it in you first. I guess it's not a big secret, but it's yours if you can keep it. 
Our flaws are not blasphemy. We only are who we have to be. The world is a godly anatomy. All of our stories are part of its tapestry. So as you just love and live actually, who you are meant to be, you will be naturally. We travel to see that what is is as wise as what we would imagine should be. So no matter how broken your heart is, as long as it's beating, at least you're not heartless. Even our positive power is harnessed by finding the spark in our negative charges. Sometimes when just being you seems the hardest and the gap from your dreams to the real seems the farthest, try to leave holes for some grace where your guard is if God needs something to mold to be an artist. See, we are all works in slow progress, growing towards the light and slow process, evolved by a consciousness conscious beyond all our concepts and constructs. Like an invisible genius, silently guiding the choices it leaves us, letting us fall as we fail by our reasons to reach us and pick us back up with the pieces. Because we are all children of a great force together in this world on a strange course. A dream we can all forever aim towards is just recognizing we are all from the same source. All right, peace and thank you. Whoa. That's the business now. It's the real deal. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really one for religion. Uh, I, I question a lot, but um, I think I might go to Church of Massimo if there ever was. <laughs> um, so thank you. And now we will have Augustina, please. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Okay. Um, this is... So I have a friend who is mostly bedridden, and she shared a few words. And so I wanted to share a few thoughts as well with all of you. <clears throat> Constantly releasing jaw, shoulders, tension building up. Releasing, building, crying, sighing. Finally sharing, not so much daring. Bored of being inclined to reclined. Constant pain, up a notch. Hodgepodge spasms, slightly less. Numbness cushions much distress. I digress, I must confess. In my cocoon, in my mess, I'm melting, unraveling, sticking myself back together. Childlike sticky tape and glue pen. Will it be like this forever? Then I took a moment which wasn't completely overwhelming to feel the raw sugar jaw, sugar jar avoiding admonishment at my failure to give it up, accepting my limits while knowing when to push, no pressure from outside with help across the divide, I can keep going. I never know when everything will change for better or for worse. My head hurts, tension in the jaw, a grimace more and more. Writing helped me smile. I also sulked a while and now I'm grinning as if I'm winning. And that's by my friend, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, Augustina and your friend, Elaine. I hope she hears your beautiful reading of her work. Um, I know she's not with us here on the Zoom, but perhaps she's able to listen on Facebook. And if you are listening, Elaine, that was fantastic. And uh, keep writing, and keep sobbing and uh, It'll all make some kind of sense along the way for you. I certainly hope so. And I know there's a lot, a lot of people in a similar situation out there and your words, no doubt, will help. So fair play. And thank you, Augustina. That was a lovely um, reading. So to take us away for the end of the night, um, can we please have Emily Davis Fletcher? I think Hi. 
Thank you. Um, I just want to say quickly that um, the Pat Conroy Literary Center is having their um, uh, literary festival the 5th through the 8th of November. Um, there's some free events, different workshops. Um, I'll actually be reading with a few other poets on the 7th of November at 11 a.m. It's an early, early poetry reading here, but for you all, it's later in the day, so that's better. That is better. I'm a little shocked at how early it is. Um, okay, I'm going to read a poem that actually um, came from a writer's workshop at the center by Brooke McKinney. Um, so if you can get the chance to take any workshops by Brooke McKinney or anyone else at the center, it's totally worth it. Um, okay, the poem is When You Knock on My Door. And it's after the painting Cabello Blanco in El Salon by Jose Marino Villa. Yeah. A white horse dances on two legs. Her vanilla tail curls like smoke, points at the blossom of a scarlet chair, opened wide and ready to take you in its arms. A cross is lost on graying walls, and a woman in a navy dress, let's call her reason, walks out into a burning forest, the quiet part of my heart that doesn't ask how long will you stay. And this is the, um, the picture, if anyone wants to see it. It was, we had to write an acrostic poem based off an image we brought. And I totally botched that for Spanish surrealist painter's name. Thank you, though. Thank you, Emily. That was beautiful, as always. Thanks, everybody. What a great night. Um, I know I fumbled my words a few times, but sure, hey, what can you do? I did my best and I, I, I enjoyed listening to you all very much, um, especially our guest poet, Kubis Muman. Thank you. He's not here now, but um, he might watch this after. So, yeah, thank you big time to Kubis. And I certainly hope that you, Yutsa Sharma, who wasn't able to join us, is okay. So I send a little bit of love out into the across the, uh, the oceans all the way to Nepal and hopefully he's he's okay and that nothing bad happened to prevent him from being with us. Um, so to everybody that took part, I'm looking at all your lovely little faces there. Thank you for taking part. Um, wish you all a great month. I hope, I, hope we see you next month. I'll be glad that I won't have to MC again for a little while because it is quite scary actually, knowing it's all going out there into the big wide tinternet world. Um, there you go. That's what I have to say to the great wide tint world. Um, we're going to move on now to our private little chats. Um, so, We'll say goodbye to Facebook. Bye, Facebook. And hello.